Good morning to those of you who are joining us from the Americas um, and good afternoon and good evening to those who are joining us from Africa, Europe and Asia. Um, my name is Manjiri Mahajan. I'm Associate Professor for International Affairs and Co-Director of the India China Institute at the New School University in New York. I'll be the moderator of today's panel, which is co-sponsored by the India China Institute and Africa as a country. Um, and the panel is on the topic of India, China, Africa, emerging transnational politics in the global South. So recent years have been marked by a surge of interactions between China and India on the one hand, with a range of countries in Africa on the other hand, um, these relations between the Asian giants and African countries have spanned various sectors, including agriculture, infrastructure, mining, education, pharmaceuticals, um, and they've taken on different forms, including trade, investments, technological transfers, people-to-people -people exchanges, and most recently, COVID diplomacy. For the most part, the Asian countries have avoided a paternalistic language of aid and rescue, and instead opted for a putatively more democratic discourse of partnership. And yet, these partnerships have been marked by asymmetries of power, which inevitably recall older hierarchies of both colonial and developmental eras, even if the discursive packaging now studiously avoids such references. So in many ways, these new transnational connections between Asia and Africa are re-scripting international architectures and norms of finance, development, and diplomacy. And with this panel, what we are hoping to do is kind of unpack and examine these relations, how they are playing out on the ground in individual countries within the two continents. And we hope to interrogate the implications for globalization and global governance and how this transnational politics increasingly departs from an older norm of a liberal international order that was perhaps never as liberal, never as international, nor as orderly as was often believed to be. Um, so today we are very lucky to have with us a very interesting and distinguished group of speakers. Um, um, our first speaker, so let me just go ahead and introduce our panelists. I'll introduce them one by one um, in the order you know, um, that they will be speaking. Um, our first speaker will be Manjusha Nair, who's Associate Professor of Sociology at George Mason University. Um, prior to this, she was Assistant Professor of Sociology at the National University of Singapore. She completed a PhD in sociology from Rutgers University and an MPhil in economics from um, JNU from the Jawaharlal Nehru University. In her research, Manjusha, in her research, which is at the intersection of globalization and counter -hege hegemonic movements, uh, Manjusha has explored a variety of topics such as labor politics and social movements, rural protests and land politics, um, and South South economic flows and social relations. Her award-winning book, Undervalued Dissent, Informal Worker Politics in India, examined how economic reforms have weakened the ability of rural migrant workers to use democratic forms of contention. Um, she is the chair of the Global Division and a member of the Justice 21 Committee of the Society for Study of Social Problems. Um, before I turn it over to Manjusha, I just want to note that um, we'll take all questions at the end after all the speakers have finished speaking. Um, so request to the audience to please put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, the chat forum is unavailable to the audience. Um, so without further ado, let me turn this over to Manjusha. Manjusha, all yours. Thank you, uh, Mark and Manjari, for inviting me to this panel, which I think is timely. I know that the world is still under siege, especially India, uh, by the pandemic. But I also think that uh, it's time to think about the uh, post-pandemic world in which global capital and investments are uh, doubtless going to roll back to life. So I will uh, share my screen now. I have some PowerPoint slides, which I would like to share.
So I'm going to talk today about Afro-Asian solidarity and its possibilities and constraints in this contemporary era of global neoliberal global capitalism. So as European colonialism was ending, visions of Afro-Asian solidarity characterized the Bandung Conference in 1955. Uh, which was attended by 28 new nations, only six uh, African uh, nations were present because the rest were still colonized. So they drew inspiration from these histories of social and cultural exchanges uh, during, I mean, around the Indonesian um, um, and the networks of uh, uh, traders, merchants, laborers, soldiers, pilgrims, poets, ideas that traveled um, um, along the, in these uh, transcontinental um, journeys, as has been uh, beautifully described by historian Shugata Bosch. So these, uh, the conference created or thought about political spaces and actually created political spaces for anti-colonial and anti-apartheid resistance. And it also uh, held an imagination of a collective future through cultural, economic, political, and even spiritual uh, collaboration and um, imbued with post-colonial camaraderie. So none of these emancipatory visions were materialized. So I will talk about it later. So it was only in the temporal context of contemporary neoliberal capitalism uh, where new, I mean, these old visions have emerged uh, in a way, or new versions of these old visions have emerged. And I would, uh, so by neoliberal capitalism, I mean uh, the diffusion of the ideology and practices around um, a very a fundamental form of, uh, I mean, market dominance or market fundamentalism as it is. Uh, called by some, and uh, the specifically uh, the rise of Asia in this context, uh, due to which these uh, new validations of the old visions have emerged. So my research explores the possibilities, however tainted they might be of global capitalism of the neoliberal variety, or the recovered vision of the new Afro-Asian solidarity in the new engagements of Asia and Africa. So uh, this is a photograph from the third India uh, Africa Forum Summit, which was uh, um, in New Delhi in 2015. So you can see that uh, 54 um, representatives of uh, African states were present. And uh, so they are all wearing custom made silk Indian dresses with turban. And so there was a lot of effort put into welcoming them. And uh, so a lot of partnerships around the Indian Ocean uh, rim were discussed and entered into. And the selectively chosen histories of Indonesian connection, anti-colonial resistance, so, so all these were used to cement this partnership. So in the words of Nigerian President Muhammad Buhari, Africa has a number of partnership arrangements with other countries of the world, but this promises to be different as it is not only a partnership between friends, but between countries and peoples who have had similar historical experiences of colonial rule. So then Narendra Modi visited Mozambique, South Africa, Tanzania, and Kenya, so, uh, in which he evoked this shared past to show that how India is better and a more reliable partner than China and offered Indian expertise in meeting the soaring health needs of the African continent laid the ground plans for future collaborations, and he invited African manufacturers to India as part of his Make in India initiative. Um, so, but, but if you look at the trend in trade, uh, so this is the Indian imports from Sub-Saharan Africa in 2014, one year before the summit. Uh, it actually talks about a different picture than the rhetoric. So this in a way imitates the classic colonial trade pattern of buying natural based goods such as crude oil and copper while flooding the African market with the consumer merchandise. And so, uh, so then we hear stories, not just of India, China definitely of enclaves, bribes, human rights violation, debt trap, state capture in South Africa. So these stories circulate and so many undoubtedly see this as another enactment of uh, colonial imperialism. 
and uh, a few scholars have characterized this as the new, I mean, re-scramble for Africa. So it is to this debate that I wish to contribute in the talk. Uh, in this talk, so I have been engaged in uh, researching Indian investments in South Africa and uh, Ethiopia, Indian investments and the flows of uh, not just of capital, of commodities and people uh, that happen along with that. So I looked at two mining corporations in South Africa and also uh, looked at uh, textile manufacturing union in Ethiopia. So um, I spent around three and a half months doing research. So, um, so the, my last visit was in today's textile factory in Addis Ababa, near Addis Ababa in a place called Bishoftu where they source raw cotton from Africa. So that is of the brand, the denning products that they make. They make the textile and they also stitch garments and they are exporting it through the duty-free export market that has been created in the US through the Africa Growth Opportunity Act uh, um, uh, partnership. So I'm making two arguments or two counterpoints today. Uh, my first argument is that calling this uh, neocolonialism is a misnomer uh, because I feel most of the post-colonial nation states after political independence continue to be uh, incorporated into Western systems of both economic and uh, epistemological domination through extraction, export of agricultural uh, commodities, aid and uh, development projects, and uh, later the Washington Consensus. So thus they were always embedded in the global economy as a periphery. So I'm using the world systems perspective here. And so India and China, they are new agents but they are also new subjects. They are always situated in the periphery or have always been situated in the periphery of the world economic order. So even if they are creating new assemblage of capital, labor and nature, so they are only reproducing the old form of capitalism with all its structural violence and exclusion. Hence this extraction, debt trap, development aid, educational, I mean, aid, suppression of union. So all these are reproduced. So there is no wonder there is so much of anxiety and opposition to the presence of China and India because they are uh, agents of the same capitalism. Capitalism from the global south is still capitalism and it's still domination and appropriation and exploitation. Well, but on the other hand, my, my second counterpoint, which is coming from my research is that, so while I saw this capitalist domination, what was not visible that much was the violence and dehumanization that is associated with colonial capitalism, which later uh, continues as well. Or there was less of an othering of the Africans as the dangerous classes or the over-sexualization of women or uh, infantilization or the negation of their right to exist, which were certain ways in which colonialism inscribed itself in the cognition of both the colonizers and the colonized. So I could say that I saw, uh, I, I, I didn't see the old visions of post-colonial solidarity, but as occupiers of the peripheries of the world economic uh, global north determined order, I saw a rather human interaction based on my research on this um, Indian corporations and also my observations, casual observations on uh, what was happening with Chinese investments. So I'll provide just one example. So a lot of Indians went to Ethiopia as teachers in the 1950s, 60s, because Ethiopia did not have teachers training colleges. So now there are 500 Indian professors. This is like the new migration in um, Ethiopian universities. These are like uh, new, I mean, investments by the Ethiopian government. So every person I met in Ethiopia either had a chemistry teacher, um, an Indian woman in their school. So they have memories or uh, the, all the textile, I mean, industry supervisors I met they were taught by Indian lecturers and they were recommended to these jobs by their professors in the textile engineering colleges. So uh, there is this collective regard for Indians, which I felt, which facilitated 
my research is um, as well. And also it was reinforced by these middle level managers who are there to train the shop floor machine operators in this factory. Uh, so I don't want to go into other examples, uh, but I could give them if you want more in the question and answer session. Uh, so I would like to say conclude by saying that uh, I found that Indian and African interactions in all these cases range from paternalistic kinship to camaraderie, drawing from multiple registers of developmental hierarchies, colonial racial imaginaries, civilizational similarities, post-colonial solidarity, and third world citizenship. So I've come back with the feeling that it is better to be this way colonized by Indians and Chinese in Africa than by Northern capital and aid, because as much as they are agents of capitalism, I felt they were less violent. I mean, both epistemic and physical violence and more cautious. And I saw more instances of laughter, hilarity and kinship in these exchanges. I just wanted to, this is like a, a photo of, um, I mean, a painting of Mahatma Gandhi, which was, painted by Lemaguya, an Ethiopian painter, which was in display in the factory. This was painted in 2016. It was surprising to me that there is so much of controversy around Gandhi and his racial imaginaries. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manjusha, for that very interesting presentation. And I think it's these snapshots from fieldwork on the ground that in are so valuable in informing these large narratives of neo-colonialism and neoliberalism. Uh, but I do want to go on to our next panelist, who's Veda Vedyanathan. Um, she is a researcher who has been working on Asia-Africa interactions for the past eight years. Um, Veda has curated and led transnational teams in projects examining Chinese and Indian engagement in various African countries across sectors, including infrastructure development in Tanzania and Kenya, pharmaceutical manufacturing in Ethiopia, agricultural cooperation in Zambia, and mining in Zimbabwe. Um, she's currently a visiting associate fellow at the Institute of Chinese Studies in New Delhi, and has been a consultant for research institutes in Africa, specializing in gathering grassroots perspectives to conduct um, research to inform policy. Um, Veda completed her PhD from the Center for African Studies at the University of Mumbai, and then she was a postdoctoral fellow of the Indian Council of Social Science Research and later the Harvard Yenching Institute. Um, so Veda, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Manjari. I'll just share my screen. Thanks, Manjari, for that uh, introduction and also for the invitation to come to the panel. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I think I should also just take a quick moment and acknowledge that it is a very difficult time um, in the world, but especially in India. So for all those of you listening to us from India or who have family or friends in India, our thoughts and prayers are with you. Um, I think of all the challenges that uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has thrown open, one of them is also uh, to see how countries in the global south are going to, um, you know, are going to um, interact with each other in a post pandemic era. In this sense, I've spent the last few years looking at Indian and uh, Chinese um, actors on the ground. And while on the face of it, you wouldn't want to compare these two entities. These are as separate as separate can be. There are fundamental differences in the way these countries operate. But I've sort of found that there are, um, and like what Manjush has said, building on this um, understanding of all this lens of Afro-Asian solidarity, there are certain loose similarities in the way India and China approach countries in the continent. So for one, both of these countries keep and regularly allude to the historicity of interactions. They examine present day realities, if it's the Belt and Road Initiative or the International Solar Alliance, back to uh, you know, how historic and old these relationships are. They are very deliberate and measured in the language that is often used in official parlance, which often stress on the equality of the relationship, on African priorities, on win-win relationships. They also present a notion of policy coherence, strategy, and how there is a continuity of strategy with time. Both uh, New Delhi and Beijing also seem to address seeming deficiencies that sort of come up. So when as ground realities change, there is a sense that they are also adapting their policies. 
And they also rely extensively on African nations in multilateral forums. And while both Beijing and New Delhi keep stressing on the fact that the center of their relationship is people to people relations. We've seen xenophobia and charges of racism against Africans in both India and in China. So while they are, there are loose similarities, there are also very different strengths that these two countries bring uh, when they come to interact in the continent. A few things I'd like to point out. For one, uh, one thing that I've noticed that Indian private companies enjoy in the continent is a familiarity. To just give you a quick context, I was invited by a few undergraduates in Bolkite University for um, a post-conference uh, soiree. And uh, one of them actually thought that Tata was an African company. And he wouldn't believe me when I said, no, it was Indian. He said, no, but it's been around since my mother was a little girl. Like, what do you mean it's not African? So there is an inherent familiarity with Indian brands that also obviously comes because India has a huge diaspora in the continent. And with it comes shared you know, cultural references. So, and also shared love for Bollywood and similar food and so on. But interestingly, there are several civil society organizations who have been very successful in India, like the Barefoot College, which trains illiterate women to become solar engineers. You see this model being picked up by African states. There's also the Kudumbashree model in Kerala, which is a self-help group, uh, which has really been successful in uh, Kerala. You see that model also being replicated. So in contrast, the scale of Indian operations are much more smaller, but they're different and layered. Similarly for China, of course, Chinese, uh, China relies extensively on the continent for support of the one China policy. So as you could see recently, um, when Burkina Faso and Gambia and several countries shifted uh, and recognized Beijing, um, they did gain economically from that decision. China is also emerging as an alternate financier to traditional donors. And um, Africa is also uh, becoming central uh, to its larger Belt and Road Initiative conversation. So what, uh, what I thought I would do today is, uh, there's no question of comparison. So I didn't want to compare China's infrastructure projects in Africa with Indians, because like I said, the scale and the quantum of resources, et cetera, are not comparable. That said, I thought I would sort of just quickly share my snapshots from the field of two sectors where I think India and China are going to become major um, actors going forward. For India, that's pharmaceutical manufacturing. And I realize the irony of talking about this now, but um, fact remains that pre-pandemic and hopefully post-pandemic, the India-Africa health relationship is actually very robust. It's multidimensional. There are Indian clinics and hospitals that have invested in several African countries. There are doctors uh, that go from India who work in Africa. There are several um, uh, frameworks built to sort of boost this relationship. But, but the most promising area, I think, is the fact that a lot of Indian pharmaceutical companies, not just the big ones, but like the mid-level ones, are looking to expand overseas. So some of them have zero operations abroad. They've been successful in India. And their first go-to place are often countries like Ethiopia and Kenya, because they provide a lot of incentives for foreign investors, because they themselves are trying to create a pharmaceutical manufacturing base. And interestingly, um, not just pharmaceutical manufacturing per se, but industries that are uh, auxiliary industries that surround it. It could be logistics. It could be you know making the heart in gelatin capsule. It could be uh, processing maize, which is used in pharma. There are a lot of opportunities in these sectors. And the fact that Indian companies are very open to joint ventures with African firms make it even more interesting. But uh, having interviewed um, Indian pharmaceutical actors in Bombay, in Ethiopia, and in, um, uh, in Addis Ababa, and in Nairobi, th these were some of the challenges that were brought up. So one, the question of pricing. So they said if they manufacture products in um, Africa, they can't compete with Indian and Chinese imports that come into countries. Uh, there's also an absence of locally available um, raw materials. So they said something simple like spare parts and flavorants have to be imported. They also talked about a skills uh, gap in the local workforce. They talked about absence of critical support for missionary, something small. So one of the engineers told me that they missed a $20 spare part, but they couldn't run the plant for months till they had to import it from somewhere else. They also talked about the fact that work permits in some countries, of course, not generalizing, are difficult and expensive. And also because of issues like interrupted power supply, the plants don't always run in full capacity. As a matter of fact, some of the plants that I visited, while I was visiting them, the power, uh, there was a power outage. So all the workers were just sitting down wherever they were waiting for the power to come back up. 
so, so this is just some some sense of you know the kind of ground realities indian companies face now one of the strengths that uh, the china brings to the table of course and everybody knows this this has been well studied is the fact that it is now the single largest financier for african infrastructure constructing one in three and financing one in five when we discussed when we talked to um, chinese contractors on the ground and we asked them what is your aim like what what was their individual you know aspirations or their company aspirations one of them one of the things that kept coming up was the idea that they want to push chinese standards so a lot of the time for instance the zanzibar airport that i studied or the national itc broadband i studied they mentioned that while african governments seem to prefer british or american standards these companies wanted to push chinese standards and they also wanted to build brand china there was a pressure to sometimes finish projects much before time just so that uh, china is perceived as a player you know as uh, at par with other western uh, traditional builders they also mentioned and this i found really fascinating when we study smaller projects like the matwara gas pipeline they told us that they are not expecting profits from this investment but they are hoping that doing a good job with this investment and building this ahead of schedule will gain them further investments in the future and so it was sort of a long term uh, you know idea of capturing the infrastructure market so having spoken to indian infrastructure companies in africa like sharpunji pulunji and lasan chubro and so on some of the advantages that we thought that um, china had specific uh, in relation to indian actors and also other actors was of course competitive pricing access to a comprehensive industrial value chain in china the ability to move construction vessels and machinery which were resting across africa um, easy acquisition of cheap raw materials uh, low salaries paid to high skilled engineers Uh, an entrepreneurial culture which is to say that um some of the project sites that i visited they just had containers in which they had converted into homes and offices so uh, one of the kenyan officials i i interviewed he said you know when we have a european uh, company do construction there's a lot of overheads that go into just maintaining the workforce but you walked into these project sites with chinese managers and chinese workers they lived uh, on exceptionally frugal sort of means on site um and of course um the absence of local competition was cited over and over again so th these are areas in which there is incredible promise these of course there are many many layers to these conversations which can maybe be discussed during q and a but there's also significant pushback so for instance indian uh, companies have been accused of selling substandard drugs in the continent um infrastructure projects have been cited to be exceptionally delayed um some taking years to finish and that's been attributed to bureaucratic red tape so and while there are um several small and uh, medium enterprises going from india um and finding success in africa there are several agro business companies mining companies and even entrepreneurs individual entrepreneurs that have become the cautionary tales of things that you really shouldn't do when you are in a foreign um country a foreign host country and another big um, advantage disadvantage that we found when it came to india was that on the one hand you talked about the government's human centric uh, development cooperation and on the other hand you talked about the private sector's uh, interest and they all seem to operate in silos they didn't really seem to be at sync at any level uh, with china of course there there was strong um, some of the pushback included uh, environmental safeguards that weren't you know met recently we concluded a study in zimbabwe where we looked at a few chinese mining companies and poor health and safety standards was also something that was cited often with regard to infrastructure that china is building the quality of infrastructure has been called into question but also the risk of surveillance uh, in um, the infrastructure that's chinese built especially in official government uh, buildings was cited as well there's also a large and negative perception this is something chinese managers brought uh, told me over and over again the idea that you know it, the western media the western media is just is just as unfair in the way it operates it it discusses what china is doing in africa and of course there are uh, cultural differences side note you obviously see construction sites littered with mandarin um, no swahili no none of the local languages so there is a certain of course level of cultural apathy but um, th there is a larger negativity associated with chinese engagement in africa which i think is fairly absent uh, when it comes to uh, the indian side 
So just to com- conclude, I think uh, COVID-19 relief is going to become a crucial component of these relationships going forward. As we saw, China and uh, India were one of the first countries to send in supplies, to send in vaccines. They've also been helping boost uh, health infrastructure. But I think going forward to see how these countries individually manage the crisis and also then go out and help is going to define some aspects of these relationships. And to the age old question that I keep getting asked often, are China and India competing in Africa? I think, um, I hope I've sort of um, sent the message that the really that question really doesn't exist because in terms of scale, in terms of quantum of resources and the heterogeneity of activity, Chinese engagement in many ways outweighs India's at present. But it's also important to note that both these countries operate in very different realms and, um, and they offer African countries alternate pathways to development. So the end of the day, it comes down to the African agency in choosing and leveraging these very separate strengths. Um, and I think uh, the onus really is on them to see how this uh, plays off in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veda. Um, I, I want to remind the audience that if they have questions, um, please type them in the Q&A box and we'll take them at the very end after all four speakers have um, finish speaking. So our next speaker, our third speaker is Tang Xiaoyang, who is the vice chair in the Department of International Relations at Tsinghua University and deputy director <coughs> at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. His research interests include political philosophy, China's engagement in Africa, and the modernization process of developing countries. Um, he is the author of the book, Co-Evolutionary Pragmatism, Approaches and Impacts of China-Africa Economic Cooperation that was published by the Cambridge University Press in 2020. Um, and he has also published extensively on Asia-African relations in various different forums and journals. Um, um, he complete, Xiaoyang completed his PhD in the philosophy department at the New School for Social Research in New York. So he's one of ours, we think. Uh, and he earned his MA in philosophy from Freiburg University in Germany and his BA in business management from Fudan University in Shanghai. I should note that he's joining us from China. So a special thanks uh, for straddling for, for straddling time zone. So without further ado, Xiaoyang, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Manjuri, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, talk uh, on an uh, event organized by my um, by my alma mater, <laughs> yeah. and uh, it's a uh, uh, pleasure to uh, discuss uh, this uh, topic as well because that's uh, such a timely issue. And uh, my uh, argument is actually listed uh, in this uh, in the topic, uh, yeah, in this uh, first uh, page. <laughs> And this is also the main uh, theme of my book. And uh, just a background introduction as a uh, uh, previous two speakers already mentioned, China and India, they are growing very quickly, but especially China's uh, ex- uh, presence in uh, Africa is quite uh, uh, astonishing because uh, as you can see, China's uh, trade with Africa is more than Africa's trade with the US, Japan, France, and uh, UK combined. Uh, currently, of course, India is uh, now the number two trade partner with Africa, but uh, actually also uh, by uh, its uh, number two with distance. <laughs> and uh, China also uh, held about more than 50, more than 60% of uh, the Africa's entire construction market in 2019. And China's FDI stock increased uh, so much as well as the FOCAC meeting uh, between China. So it's called a forum of China and Africa cooperation. It uh, held whole every three years. And uh, this year, we will see another Fokaka uh, meeting. And uh, then my uh, question is, uh, 
what are China's approach in Africa to get such an effective impact? And my answer is just it's diverse, flexible, and pragmatic. It doesn't follow any models. And especially, it doesn't even follow its own models. And what are the impacts of these approaches? Then it's about better effects to drive industrial transformation. So I reject all these uh, uh, labels like authoritarianism, neocolonialism, or even developmental state. Uh, and uh, yeah, But also this win-win and friendship, this kind of uh, positive labels, I also reject it because uh, in fact, China's approach in Africa is uh, quite uh, diverse and uh, flexible. And then it uh, brings to the main point, uh, in spite of its diversity and flexibility, it has a consistent goal. So this uh, target is, uh, is especially important for China's engagements in Africa. So the, the target is uh, uh, about uh, sustaining productivity growth. And this uh, is uh, also a continuation of China's own development uh, uh, trend or guideline since the 1980s. It has become the central task of uh, the uh, Chinese Communist Party. And uh, people may say, oh, China is uh, like a very capitalistic or is very business oriented. But in fact, this is actually, I think I just uh, uh, echo, I'm echoing what uh, uh, Neil said uh, about this capitalism. It's actually about, a, it's related to capitalism. But uh, when we look at the history, it's a uh, uh, response to the challenge of this uh, Western capitalism. And this, uh, in order to respond to this uh, uh, capitalist uh, threat, in fact, China has to adopt the capitalist uh, manner. So this is my argument. Because uh, actually, the Karl Marx, uh, in his book, uh, uh, Criticizing the Capitalism, he pointed out capitalism has this uh, 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 yeah, incentives to continuously uh, yeah, pro grow the productivity. And this is a, uh, this kind of endless pursuit of productivity growth and surplus value. It drives capitalism to overwhelm all other kinds of societies. And China actually, after hundreds of years of struggle, China understands that and China knows we need to adopt capitalism to fight against capitalism and that China also wants all the developing partners to do the same. So this uh, uh, pursuit of the productivity it's uh, mainly about the division of labor, as Adam Smith already mentioned in his uh, book, uh, Wealth of Nation, the greatest improvement of productivity is uh, nothing but a division of labor. It's the same even today. These are the pictures I take, uh, I took uh, from uh, uh, Ethiopia, and you can see the traditional one-man uh, workshop to the modern Chinese factories. But in in fact, the principle is just about the Chinese modern factories has more division of labor. And uh, this also then leads to a very comprehensive uh, transformation in the societies. So from uh, traditional agrarian societies, which existed in China, in India, and also in Africa about subsistence production and the limited uh, commodity change, and also depends largely on self-sufficiency. Then this uh, must uh, move to the industrial capitalism them which pursues uh, continuous productivity growth. So this uh, then generates the phenomenon of uh, mass production, uh, specialization, and the use of machinery, as well as a mass distribution and consumerism, and also the stress of market function. And uh, together with them are corresponding political, societal, and environmental changes.
I need to move the next slide. Uh, I don't know here. Uh, okay, sorry. Okay, so with that uh, great transformation, and uh, then the components are interdependent with each other. We need a functioning market. We need also efficient governance. We need skilled workers and infrastructure facilities, as well as others. So this uh, equilibrium of subsist subsistence production to the uh, balance of industrial capitalism, this change actually uh, is uh, critical for all the developing countries which wants to realize industrialization and uh, which want uh, the real like uh, growth. But uh, the, the main problem uh, is that uh, all these components, they are interdependent on each other and uh, they have a mutual causation. So this chicken and egg uh, dilemma is a uh, uh, exists also in China itself and uh, also in all the developing countries. And as for this, then I think that in the China's success to develop during the last 40 years, it's mainly because China had this uh, uh, co-evolutionary pragmatism, which helped the country counter the uh, yeah, to chicken and egg dilemma. So it's uh, the local actions uh, and the strategic direction has uh, the balance. And uh, also then with the firm goal of productivity growth and uh, they understand the functioning of market is not simply given as some uh, Western uh, shock therapy theorist suggested, but uh, they actually know the market needs time and uh, multilateral full efforts to forge, to forge, and there's a trial and error gradualism. Uh, Co-evolution as a whole requires interactive, lively coordination rather than one-dimensional fixed uh, rules. And uh, this is uh, uh, in a nutshell. It's just uh, what uh, Deng Xiaoping, the Chinese uh, leader for the market reform, said. Uh, yeah, it's uh, with a firm uh, target, and uh, then to cross the river by touching stones. And uh, that's also why China told us that uh, African countries do not copy our model because there's no such mo uh, model. We just uh, formulate a policy according to the national condition to gradual experiment. So I summarize that uh, uh, argument also in this table. So versus uh, the orthodox uh, view and yeah, which is mainly the Washington consensus. Uh, that uh, Washington consensus emphasized on model while Chinese view emphasized on target and uh, so it's the productivity growth and uh, also the framework Washington consensus always talks about state market dualism but in fact China is not really caring so much about the authoritarianism or the state market dualism because there are a lot of uh, comprehensive and diverse transformation in different regions and uh, throughout these decades and uh, then uh, uh, theoretically, Washington consensus is based on linear causal mechanism, while Chinese then is based more on circular interactions between various all actors. It's actually like the um, uh, dynamism of a soccer team and as approaches. So Washington consensus use the conditionality while China then instead uh, talking more about a flexible business experiment. So these are the main arguments of my um, yeah, study on China-Africa relationship. And I have some more detailed case studies on trade, this market formation, as well as on infrastructure. You can always see this uh, dilemma of uh, uh, yeah, the, like, uh, the infrastructure and the supporting industries, which one should go first. And China is using this experimental way to solve that. As well as uh, in agriculture and in manufacturing, we, as well, we also can see this uh, dilemma between the sector and then this uh, value chain, uh, yeah, this uh, correlations. And, uh, 
as well as uh, like special economics or even environment and uh, employment problems. But due to the time limit, I will stop here and I welcome uh, your questions uh, in the Q&A yeah, for further discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Xiaoyang, uh, for that fascinating um, presentation. Our final speaker, I just want to keep moving, our final speaker will be Lina Ben Abdullah, who's joining us from Algeria right now, but um, she is assistant professor at Wake Forest University and senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies Africa program. Um, she is the author of the recent book, Shaping the Future of Power, Knowledge Production, and network building in China-Africa relations. Her research has appeared in several journals, including International Studies Quarterly, the Journal of International Relations and Development, Third World Quarterly, and many more, as well as in public facing outlets, such as the Washington Post, Monkey Cage, and Foreign Policy. Um, and she's also a contributing editor to Africa as a country. So um, over to Lena. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to be part of this fantastic panel. Um, I think this topic is, is, is wonderful because, um, you know, in many ways, I as a scholar tend to uh, research and, and be interested in a lot in South-South relations and Global South relations. Um, we talk a lot about Global South in general. I think that a panel like today is where we get to disentangle a little bit what we mean by South-South relations, uh, take a look at the di differences and similarities between the approaches uh, of China uh, and India in Africa is extremely timely and very important. And I have to say, I've learned a lot already from my fellow panelists and I'm excited to share my little bit, um, which is going to focus mostly on China, uh, Africa. I'm going to present some of the main findings and the driving motivations behind um, my book, my recently published book, um, which looks at uh, China-Africa relations from an international relations background, which is my, my background. So it's a little bit theoretical, uh, but the, 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 the main uh, uh, motivation behind the book was to try to um, answer questions about what do we mean by rising powers? What, how, do, how do the rising powers rise? What, what do, do their mechanisms of power, uh, power projection look like? Uh, and especially when we're looking at Global South, and this is a very unique um, and extremely important uh, relationship to study because it, it provides us with um, in a, a vista on uh, international power relations away from the typical North-South relations or away from the typical Eurocentric, uh, Western-centric theories that we uh, are used to studying and looking at in international relations theory and other disciplines I imagine as well. So these are the motivations behind uh, my, my research was really building on observations that I have done on the ground on based on fieldwork, based on interviews, observations, and trying to come up with um, a, a way to include um, a bit more theorizing of China-Africa relations. Um, and um, uh, in my particular uh, framework, I, I really appreciate Xiaoyang was saying China doesn't follow any model, it doesn't have any model, it's, it's basically very pragmatic in its way. And I, I really like that. And I really like that we're not, he, he said he rejects labels, right? He rejects all the labels that are typically associated with, you know, this is what China's story in Africa is. I'm going to have a label. Uh, a small one, <laughs> um, and it's it's going to be uh, mostly looking at relational power. Uh, if I'm going to choose one label, so in my research, I I move a little bit away from the typical uh, images and representations of China's investments in Africa that are uh, that hone in on infrastructure projects, on natural resource investments, and the like. And I I, I try to move the discussion a little bit more towards. Uh, relations, relationality, people-to-people -people relations, um, and, 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 and the like. Uh, okay. and, and in so doing, Lina, I just, focus on network building. Lina, just one second. Would you mind moving your PowerPoint presentation to presentation mode? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. That would just make it Is easier. this better? Much better. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Yeah. No, of course. Um, and so in so doing, I look at network, the importance of network, building network, 
uh, professional and personal uh, networks between Chinese and African counterparts. Um, and in, in, in by network, I mean both in, in terms of uh, just people to people at the level of student scholarships at the level, but also at the level of uh, civil uh, servants and government bureaucrats, officials, elites, uh, and the different opportunities for seminars, exchanges, uh, scholarships and trainings that exist between China and Africa. Um, and I try to focus on that. I try to see uh, that connective tissue that is being created through these uh, 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 network building opportunities. I look at it from the perspective of what kind of knowledge is being produced, what is being talked about, what kind of norms are being diffused, what, how are these uh, seminars, how, how do they shape the China-Africa relations? How are they going to impact the relations between China and Africa moving forward? 10, 15, 20 years uh, from now, what do we know? What do we, how do we learn? Uh, what do we learn from approaching China-Africa relations away from the infrastructure projects and more into this people-to-people -people connective tissue? Um, and um, just to provide a very uh, kind of uh, quick snapshot at this human capital uh, that I'm interested in in my research, um, uh, in the book and, in, and, 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 and beyond. Um, so this is a quote from Wang Yi from uh, October 15, 2020, where he uh, it was just uh, outlining uh, basically uh, some of these opportunities. And here you see that he said, China uh, uh, has provided about 120 government scholarships to African countries, set up 61 Confucius Institutes and 44 Confucius classrooms in collaboration with 46 countries, sent 21,000 doctors and nurses in medical teams to 48 African countries, treating around 220 million African patients and forced 150 pairs of sister cities. All of this is to say that uh, we can look at and approach the China, uh, Africa, China's presence in the continent uh, 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 of Africa a little bit uh, differently when we look at uh, the human uh, uh, capital investments. Um, and of course, when we talk about human capital investments and China-Africa relations, we have to talk about the uh, form of China-Africa uh, cooperation, which is in short FOCAC. Uh, FOCAC uh, was already talked a little bit about by my former uh, panelists, co-panelists. Um, it is uh, basically uh, a, a, a summit uh, that uh, takes place every three years. Um, and it brings together Chinese and African leaders together so that they can discuss the next three years of uh, China-Africa relations. So this for forum uh, started in the year 2000. Um, as uh, uh, mentioned uh, today, India has a summit, uh, a summit for India-Africa relations. Uh, of course, Japan also has a summit for uh, Japan-Africa relations and South Korea, as well as France. And, and, and other countries as well. So this isn't very unique to China, although it really became a, a staple and icon of China-Africa relations. Uh, in 2018, just to uh, throw some of these numbers at you, uh, for a sake of example, uh, some of these uh, pledges for human capital investments included 50,000 government scholarships, 50,000 training opportunities for seminars and workshops, 1,000 high caliber professionals, 20 plus 20, this is for universities and higher education institutions, Luban workshops, which are vocational training colleges, um, uh, 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 which are uh, being open in different countries in, in, in Africa. Um, Djibouti has one, South Africa has one. Uh, recently, uh, I visited Mali and I saw that there was, uh, the, the one in Mali was completed, albeit it, it's not open yet. Um, and I believe, um, I believe Ghana has one. Um, so um, uh, uh, other opportunities of the same, uh, just, just to show what these in, uh, uh, human capital investments uh, basically look like on the ground. Um, in terms of international students in China, uh, this is fascinating to look at the numbers. Uh, uh, in the year 2003, you can just uh, look at this column here for Africa, you see, uh, about a total of 1,793 African students studying in Chinese universities. Uh, you scroll down to basically 2016, uh, you see 61,000, and then it jumps uh, again to 81,000 uh, uh, plus uh, 81,000 uh, African students who are in Chinese universities. Today, um, Chinese universities are the top destination of African students, especially uh, the ones coming from Anglo, um, Anglophone African countries. And, and so this is 
basically showing the trend of these ties, of these connections. When students go to the universities, when they study, when they uh, attend these universities, uh, and all that sort of relational aspect, that people-to-people -people tie, the cultural exchanges that go with that. Um, of course, FOCAC itself is, a, is a, an example of focusing on the network. So it brings together specialists and experts from China and from all African countries to discuss specific topics. Um, and, and, and today there are multiple, several small uh, subsets of FOCAC. It's not, there's the big summit or the forum, but then there are other meetings that are under the umbrella of FOCAC, which focus on particular sectors like this one, which is on think tank, right? Or this one, um, which was held uh, uh, to focus on security and uh, defense. And you see here, uh, high ranking attaches from several African countries going to China for about two weeks to discuss, to talk, to visit, to uh, uh, basically build that network, that build that connective tissue, build that uh, uh, infrastructure of, of people to people relations and not necessarily uh, the, the, the other type of infrastructure. So uh, uh, this is a media cooperation. I actually got to attend one of these in Beijing um, in 2000, I wanna say 14, it was the second. Uh, forum 2014, I think. Um, but I want to say here, and this is going all the way back to the very first presentation in this panel, that this isn't new, that this uh, uh, impact or this uh, the importance of the people to people ties uh, and this solidarity actually goes, has its roots in the early years and the early days of China-Africa relations. It has its roots in the Bandung spirit in that anti-colonial uh, uh, moment of uh, solidarity between China and, and its African uh, counterparts to basically uh, 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 essentially help and, and support Africans anti-colonial and wars of independence. So this trend of people to people relation spans the temporalities. Uh, it's not something that just was created through FOCAC. It's not something that is new do, uh, and we see through uh, uh, since the 2000s, but it's something that goes uh, back uh, to the 1950s and the 1960s and also moves into um, uh, uh, the future because this is an image of a very recent uh, training uh, because of, of, of the pandemic uh, travel restrictions have uh, meant that a lot of those opportunities to bring Africans to China for these particular people to people and, and, and elite to elite uh, meetings and trainings uh, have been hindered by the pandemic. But what we have seen is actually they've continued and they are, they are even stronger now. Uh, they are, you know, albeit sort of virtually held uh, like we're meeting today, but, but, the, but, but the pandemic in a way did not really stop that. So it, essentially what I wanted to contrast here is that it's something that uh, the people to people and human capital investments are an, an icon for me. They are the, 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 the core of, of, of China uh, uh, Africa relations, they have uh, uh, basically started in the past and they continue now through the pandemic, um, even though travel restrictions have, have existed. Uh, and beyond China-Africa relations, I'm also interested in exploring and the Belt and Road Initiative, again, away from the infrastructure uh, 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 focus and investments on infrastructure, building infrastructure, but more into the strengthening of these sort of connective tissue, the social capital, and the uh, uh, basically the human uh, capital that is being built through these network uh, uh, building opportunities that are iconic of the China-Africa relations. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Lina. Um, you know, I, it's just been a fascinating set of presentations where we've had a range of observations from fieldwork from the site about how firms from India and China, how governments, how people to people interactions take place. And they've been kind of juxtaposed with an effort to really also theorize about these um, relationships. And it's been fascinating that the United States and Europe really haven't been mentioned and definitely not been used as a kind of default framework for thinking about these relations. Um, we have a number of questions from the audience, but I was wondering if I could pose um, the first question by really asking the panelists to try and bring the focus back on 
what governments and institutions within the African continent, how they view and engage with these Indian and Chinese investments and diplomatic efforts. Um, so, I mean, just specifically, you know, we have heard a lot about what the Indian government and Indian firms and Chinese government and Chinese firms and forums um, are trying to do. But from your fieldwork and from your research, I'm wondering if you could throw some light on whether, let's say, the Ethiopian or the Kenyan governments offer different terms for foreign direct investment to Chinese um, um, companies as opposed to US or European companies? Um, are there points of contention and tension around labor relations, around environmental issues? So, so kind of turning the lens to not just talking about these countries, but also maybe from your research, what you might know about what these governments and um, institutions and people within these governments might be thinking about and saying and doing about um, Chinese and Indian um, actions. So. So any of you who might want to take this on. Manjish. I could, yeah, I could take this. I mean, since uh, I've, I did some research on uh, labor relations in both in South Africa and Ethiopia as well. Um, so first I would say that I, I know, I mean, uh, the Ethiopian state is now uh, being promoted as the Ethiopian development state because uh, it, uh, I mean, until now, there are a lot of World Bank and IMF projects, but they resisted the Washington consensus. So they never part of that. Uh, so, um, so they have been trying to imitate or in a way get inspiration from the Asian development states like South Korea and China. And they feel the new, uh, since, uh, I mean, Ethiopia was a command economy until 1994. So since this industrialization and all these processes of modernization have started recently. So they feel that this is a way, I mean, this is a rather, I mean, independent path to follow than uh, uh, following the other model. So that is why uh, they welcome the Chinese infrastructure and investment and um, technical aid and assistance, as well as, uh, Indian infrastructure, not infrastructure help, but educational help along with, I mean, other kind of uh, uh, opportunities as well. Um, but I felt, I mean, both in South Africa and Ethiopia, uh, uh, maybe it's because of the contemporary time, the Indian uh, management, either in the mines or in the textile units were really cautious. For instance, uh, this textile manufacturing unit, since they were producing for brands, after the um, disaster in Bangladesh, the Rana Plaza disaster. So there are like global standards of, uh, so Ethiopia has ratified maybe eight out of the 14 uh, conventions of the International Labor Organization. So, uh, uh, so, they were, so, uh, so this textile unit, they claim that they were the only textile unit that has, uh, uh, has had a collective agreement with the workers. And so I met with the union leaders. So it uh, so they can't really do anything about the pay. I mean, the pay is really less, but the job is permanent. So it's not like a flexible kind of labor. But the turnover rate is high, and the workers are like uh, very young. But um, apart from that, uh, I mean, they follow the RAP certification, which is like a certificate agency located near me in Virginia, which allows for, um, which gives a certificate if they follow certain labor practices. So they were um, following all this very carefully and they were very cautious about the image, especially to the global brands they were uh, creating through this. And in South Africa as well, like the uh, mine managers, they would be so scared of inspection by the labor inspectors because they would really check like, I mean, there are like um, uh, uh, regulations on how many of the employers should be, uh, I mean, uh, locals. Um, so while there were a lot of accusations about they were employing migrants, uh, uh, I mean, from uh, Zimbabwe. Um, so, uh, so I felt that there was a lot of um, anxiety around and especially since all these Indian managers had like work visa issues and so on they were really careful about following the rules and many of the time the labor inspectors would be like former COSATU members trade union leaders so they would 
uh, uh, be very, I mean, particular about this. So, yeah, so I felt uh, they were much more conscious and I didn't see, and even CK Lee, who has done a lot of research in Zambia, uh, as well as maybe Tanzania. So I've said that the Chinese management, whether it's uh, mostly, I mean, uh, state invest investors, they were very careful about following the labor regulations. And this is what I've experienced from the field. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. Um, Veda, go ahead. Um, just to sort of add to that, I think the general sense that I've gotten speaking to officials in Ethiopia, or Kenya, or Zambia is the sense that they are open to uh, foreign investment, you know, so they, they keep stressing on the fact that there's no competition, the space for everybody and all of that. But that said, I think there have been several instances, especially in the recent past, when these co companies have overstepped their boundaries and the African agency has sort of snapped into action. So this could either be because there's been pressure from people, like recently in Zimbabwe, there was an attempt by a, a Chinese firm to build, um, I think it was a mining project in a national park, and there was significant backlash. Like it, the, And I think the Zimbabwe uh, Environmental Law Association led the charge. They filed, uh, filed an affidavit in the high court and they actually paused the project. So even if you look at, there, are, there is research about this. Like if you look at the number of workers, foreign workers in different African countries, it largely boils down to the African agency, right? So if there is a lot of pressure domestically to not have uh, foreign workers, there are rules in place to limit the numbers. Um, but that said, I think one of the big uh, challenges that uh, that was sort of cited about dealing with the Chinese was, you know, lack of Chinese speaking skills or not understanding the Chinese and so on. So recently, like the, Zim the Zambia Development Agency, like when I was interviewing their officials, there was a Chinese national who was hired at the ZDA just to help the Zambian authorities make sense of, uh, you know, or, you know, better negotiate deals or to understand the cultural nuances of those relationships. So you also see um, like the Kenyan and the Ethiopian governments relying on um, lawyers from Singapore or, uh, you know, um, consultants from uh, Europe to sort of negotiate better deals because they might not have the experience of negotiating mega projects. So you sort of, uh, just to sort of the short answer to, to your question is that, while there is a sense that you know we do need external support for our growth and our development, there's also um, a very strong presence of the agency sort of stepping in when those limits are sort of crossed. And in a lot of cases, that's probably because the the the, the protests are coming from the ground up. Yeah. Thank you, Veda. Um, so maybe let me move on to some of the other questions that are coming in from the audience. One is for Xiao Yang. Um, anonymous questioner who says, hi, Dr. Tang, I'm a Kenyan and have seen how Chinese companies are contributing to increased cases of corruption. Um, you are right that they might not be goal orientation, but democracy in most African countries is already fragile, with most of our leaders choosing to take contracts with the Chinese as opposed to European companies. How do you see this contributing to weakening African political institutions? Yep. Uh, this is a good question, and this question is also related to this uh, environment and the employment. I, I see them as similar because uh, this is uh, the social, political, and the legal conditions. We actually, we see often this kind of uh, uh, related social political conditions in a poor country, underdeveloped country, they are always fr uh, fragile. And uh, while the, in most of the advanced countries, this legal framework, they are very strong. And I do not uh, buy the idea say, uh, you first uh, need to have this strong legal framework so that you can develop. And exactly according to our experience and also according to this uh, mutual causality uh, analysis, we see the social and the political Analy uh, this tra strengthening, they should go hand in hand with the productivity growth. 
So when we understand that, then this corruption, they are just happening as a part of this uh, growing process. So there are stories saying, like in, even when we talk about corruption, like in South Korea, in China, in uh, Japan, they are all very corrupted countries. But however, in these countries, when you give a bribery, you get things done and these countries, they are developing. And actually with the development of the country, then you have more technology, you have a, a better a laws to control this bribery and to reduce this corruption. While in some other countries, you only have a corruption and things are not done. So I see this Chinese uh, uh, activities in the corrupted uh, in the developed country. I see that no matter actually all the investors in these countries, they have to do corruption. Even when there's a big oil company, international companies, they also do a lot of corruption, right? Maybe sometimes in the better, uh, yeah, this appearance or this disguise. But in fact, what matters is whether we see this business, actually we should see the trend, whether this business will move the country to a better development. I think that should be the criteria but of course, when they violate the laws, they should be punished. And this is also about the environment and this employment practice. When we see Chinese Indian companies, just as other investors, if they violate the labor laws, they should just be punished so that this country, they should have the same, uh, like a, a better market competition context for the country to develop further. My. Thank you, Xiaoyang. Um, Lina, did you want to come in there or no? No, I was just agreeing. Um, but um, I, I had posted in the chat uh, a link to Afrobarometer surveys for our participants or attendees who, who might be interested in looking a little bit more at the impressions uh, and perceptions of Africans of Chinese investments. And so these um, this, this was just a sneak peek from the very recent uh, surveys updated from 2014-15 of Afrobarometer, uh, taking on the question of China, China as a development model, uh, China as a, as a lender, um, and different perceptions. And so that, that, that might actually give um, you know, the, 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 the view that it's actually a mixed bag. There's just going to be a whole bunch, of, a range of spectrum of, of, of impressions going on. Uh, when it comes to this sort of holistic image of Chinese investments in Africa. So I just wanted to flag that it's it's in the chat. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think that's probably one of the takeaways from this panel that we need to kind of disaggregate this monolith of Africa, the monolith of even China and India um, into more specific, precise, historically situated um, analysis. Um, let me um, continue with questions from the audience. Um, so this is from Derek Sheridan. It's a question for Manju Shanair. Um, he says, the difference you describe between India and China as South-South capital versus Euro-American capital as a lack of both physical and epistemic violence. I have a question about the temporality and location of such violence. Are you referring to a comparison of historical scale, example, the long durée of violent primitive accumulation versus the recentness of India and China, or the contemporary US militarism versus non-intervention or different labor relations in workplaces? Um, so, so that's the question from Manjusha. Yeah, so that's a very interesting and a difficult question. So I will try to uh, answer it, um, try to answer it. Um, uh, well, I am talking about the long durée primitive uh, accumulation, but I'm not talking about that uh, uh, materialistic accumulation per se through epistemic uh, violence and so on. So I'm trying to look at the apparatus, the administrative apparatus, the colonial apparatus that was behind that, and which was also much more than that, right? So I feel uh, um, the colonial uh, administration, I mean, in India, as well as in uh, various parts of Africa, and I know particularly about the British um, colonial uh, worldview. Uh, so it comes from a very Eurocentric worldview of the self and the other, right? So and so I'm referring to post-colonial theorists um, um, 
like Franz Fanon, uh, who has, um, and Sylvia Wendell, who has talked about the construction of the other as non-being or they, as non-human or less of a human, and even as uh, sometimes uh, as animal. So there is, so which actually helps uh, primitive accumulation because I mean, since uh, especially in um, South America, right? How the natives could be, land could be taken over and also then in employing them as uh, slave labor. Uh, so it helps in slave labor, not just there, but in plantation economy and slavery worldwide. So we see a lot of that uh, everywhere, like uh, even now, like the uh, legend of the, the myth of the lazy native as uh, um, um, Said Hussain al talked about it, which, which became later part of these developmental projects, how to make them like better humans and more efficient like the West, uh, which masks this uh, otherness. Like if you are non-human, how can you be like human, right? So it's a very, uh, I guess, um, complex idea that is there. So, uh, so, uh, so I like these solutions, like even then Marxism becomes a kind of uh, emancipatory uh, solution, right? You make them, give them rights and make them uh, humans, but if you are already treating them as non-humans, how would they realize those rights, right? So in the context of Africa, um, uh, so I think of, uh, I mean, when I, when I said this, uh, incorporation into international trade and through the world system, right? So uh, Ashil Limbambe talks about how that uh, gets mediated by the post-colonial state and then citizens. So there is this view of democracy and liberalism, but citizens don't have contracts or citizens don't have rights. So it is the same processes that continue with more of an etatization of society. So I had those concepts in mind as epistemic violence. And I felt like, uh, I mean, since India, uh, well, though there is a domination of this idea of what is backward and what is forward, uh, I saw in Ethiopia, I was surprised so much of value is placed on whether you can speak English. And I have seen that in India, right? So those kind of um, comparisons, but I also felt that being on the other side of this epistemic line, uh, that kind of, pro which, where, from where the visions of post-colonial solidarity emerged as an anti-colonial and anti-imperialist resistance. So maybe that is the space to look for Afro-Asian solidarity. So that is what I meant by that. Thank yeah. you. I actually think it's a kind of important cautionary note that even though these are asymmetrical relations in many ways, we shouldn't automatically plonk uh -huh. down and presume that they mimic older models um, exactly. instead exactly. study mm -hmm. how they are manifesting on the ground and try mm -hmm. and describe those um, so maybe i'll take a couple of questions um, so liang chen has a question for veda could you please elaborate a bit about the technological standards point aren't indians um, i guess indian companies and government promoting their own standards vigorously in africa if not does it mean that indian standards are more compatible with local standards um, and I or or maybe with kind of US FDA standards for pharmaceutical manufacturing, for instance. And there's a second question which I'll also just throw out. Um, it's from Mark, my colleague Mark Fraser um, to any of the panelists. Do Chinese state-owned companies operating in Africa have different incentive strategies, power relative to Chinese private companies operating in? Africa, so state-owned companies versus private companies from China. If so, are Chinese private companies more similar to Western firms who have to seek quick profits, favorable reports to shareholders, etc.? So maybe Veda, you can go first, and somebody else can take on the question about Chinese state-owned versus private companies. Right. I think this is a really good question, and she's absolutely right. I think the Bureau of Indian Standards works very closely with several African governments to push uh, Indian standards as well. But I think the reason I pointed it out especially is because in many projects, uh, especially in Chinese projects in Africa, this becomes like a point of negotiation, right? Chinese standards become a critical point of uh, discussion. So for instance, in uh, the Zanzibar airport, I remember talking to the Zanzibari authorities and they said that, you know, they're demanding, it's part of the deal that they use Chinese uh, standards. And this also means, you know, um, uh, 
procurement of Chinese materials, using Chinese equipment and so on and so forth. And I asked him, how did that, uh, I mean, what, what happened at the end? And he said, you know, we largely decided, because again, standards just to sort of outlet, these standards are demanded by the host uh, country, right? So they said, so finally we decided that a, a massive part of the construction would be British standards. Uh, uh, certain things following Chinese standards, but we, and, and this manager, he said, but you know, we told them that the fire escape has to be British standard. I don't know what that means, but um, the the point is that um, when you look at other Chinese investments like the national ITC broadband cable, right? They've said that uh, they can only use Huawei routers, which means that in the future, any maintenance contracts uh, will go to Huawei. So the reason I sort of mentioned it in the Chinese um, in the Chinese realm is within the Indian. Um, the companies, this wasn't a point of major company, uh, like conversation. It could be possible that Indian standards are more compatible to British standards. Uh, it could also be more possible that this isn't a point of uh, push for India. Um, and also just to sort of start off the panel on uh, Mark's question, I, I always find it really fascinating that when you go off uh, and speak to very um, small scale um, Chinese uh, entrepreneurs, for instance, like in Chingola, talking to Chinese miners, um, there are some of them, uh, there are some of these people who've come from uh, mining families in, um, in China. Some of them have absolutely no history of mining. They like this one gentleman I spoke to, he came to South Africa to trade in textile, but then heard that, you know, copper is uh, a profitable business and then moved to Zambia and now trades in copper. And uh, when I ask him about uh, the Chinese state or, or, or you know, even things like um, any policies of uh, presidency, he has absolutely no clue. Like he has zero uh, um, sort of um, interest in the larger politics of it. He's there to make money, he's there to do business. Um, so I, I, I think it's really interesting that when you in interview people from the state, uh, the private, I mean, the state owned the big enterprises. It's almost like reading a press statement off of the Mofcom website because they'll tell you, oh, you know, the like for instance, if you talk to somebody from the SGR, they'll tell you about BRI and about how it's the vision of all of that. But then all of that sort of trickles down when you go down uh, to the smaller players, which is always interesting. Thanks for that. This is Xiaoyang. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, I will talk a little more about this uh, difference between state-owned and private. So there are uh, different kinds of difference. In fact, first uh, about the sectors, in fact, the state-owned uh, companies, they just concentrate in construction and in like extraction sectors. While the private uh, companies, they spread uh, more broadly. So uh, manufacturing, trade, uh, and as well as also construction and extractive. Usually the state-owned are larger, uh, the private, uh, they are more numerous. But there are also some uh, larger ones like the Huawei or uh, this uh, this uh, techno this uh, cell phone company in. Uh, in Africa. And uh, yeah, so in terms of uh, the political motivation, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the state-owned companies and uh, the larger private companies, they both know the uh, politics. They must care about the politics, while the smaller ones, of course, they do not care so much about politics. But the state-owned companies and uh, the private uh, companies, uh, when they deal with the market, they should have the uh, same motive, actually just for profit, for sustainable business. This is actually common among the state-owned and also the uh, private companies. Even when the state-owned companies say they have a, like a, a government announced a project, they still have the priority of uh, making profit or at least sustainable, uh, doing sustainable operations. 
cooperation in uh, for this project. And uh, then the state-owned companies, maybe they can get a uh, little bit, uh, get uh, more fundings from uh, like uh, China Exim Bank, China Development Bank, this uh, uh, state-owned development banks, while the private uh, companies usually have more difficulty to get, get this. But uh, also now more and more private uh, companies can also apply for this kind of uh, uh, yeah, policy fund. Only. Yeah, so uh, yeah, these are just at uh, different uh, levels. Right. Yeah, no, thank you, Xiao Yang. Um, so, so a question which I think maybe next we'll go to Lena, and it's just been asked by Huda Mustafa, and it's regarding human capital development. And the question is, what are the professions and disciplines for which African students are being trained? Or professionals being retrained and I should just add that you know I think this is kind of a really fascinating and important area to study because if these are indeed good partners as they want to be the end game really has to be about knowledge production and technological innovation from within African countries and them not just being recipients um, um, and that requires attention to the building of epistemic infrastructure, whether it being elites being trained outside or universities and educational systems and innovation and technological systems being built within. So, so Lena, over to you. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I think the very short answer to this is really all walks of life. Um, but in terms of uh, the particular areas that I focused on and I observed as I was doing field work, uh, agriculture seemed to be uh, very big, um, so bringing in uh, uh, agriculture experts from African countries to attend seminars in China, but also sending delegations of agri agri agriculture specialists from China to specific host countries in African uh, in Africa to uh, to conduct demonstrations and and and, and so forth uh, were um, extremely big. Um, I also uh, looked at media. Uh, and so this would be journalists, African journalists going to China. And I found that there were two kinds of trainings there. There were the short term and the long term. The long term were degree granting um, uh, exchanges, meaning that uh, these journalists are going to have either a master's degree or, doc or PhD or some other professional degree or others that were more technical. Uh, so this would be a couple of weeks, two months. Um, in order to, some of it would be to learn how to use the equipment, or it would be to um, discuss some uh, uh, issue or other related to, to, to reporting journalism and media. Um, and of course, there's the, there's the security military related trainings, there is the, um, um, uh, the te technology uh, related trainings. Um, I, uh, lately in, in this year, uh, the most prominent one has been in terms of public health, in terms of training and exchanging knowledge about really COVID, about best practices, uh, how to uh, 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 deal with COVID. And so this falls into the very broad category of, of these uh, public health trainings that we saw uh, occur in, in China Africa relations in, in Ebola, in, in other pandemics and, and, and I mean, uh, uh, epidemic crisis um, in the past. So there were several delegations of Chinese um, medical experts, uh, virologists and, 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 and other uh, doctors uh, who were sent to several African countries to conduct precisely the, these, these trainings and sort of share the knowledge about how best to contain and how best to uh, deal with, with, uh, with, with the pandemic. Um, so these are just a few examples, but to be honest with you, there, there, there's just both a demand side and then also a supply side of these trainings that, that uh, span all kinds of different uh, 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 areas of expertise. Yeah, yeah no, Lina, thank you. Um, and and I, I think what's on the public health note, which I also study, I think what is so interesting to note is the sheer scale of these exchanges that come from China, as opposed to so-called global health actors like the WHO or the Gates Foundation, which also do this kind of training, which really dwarf in comparison to China. And yet China's role in this kind of a building of a knowledge cohort it doesn't make it into Absolutely. global health um, debates, right? That they, Absolutely. even though they are so large. Um, we are pretty much out of time, but I want to maybe throw two last questions. So, and anybody can take it on. Um, this one is from an anonymous questioner who says, I was wondering if any of you could comment on African scholars' views on this topic 
of Africa, China, India relations, perhaps those based in the countries where you have done research? Are there other issues being raised that we should know about from the perspective of the African scholars' perspectives? Um, and then the second question, and this will be the last one really, um, from Kimberly Narona, and she asks, the way the panelists describe Sino-Indian investment sounds like both countries are courting countries in Africa. I'm curious about whether they have observed cases where countries in Africa, individually or through the African Union, have solicited investments from either China or India. What do those negotiations look like? What do those flows look like? Are they different from the conference-based investments in the continent? So um, first about perspectives of African scholars and then about negotiations initiated by African governments or companies. Who wants to go first? Anybody? I can yeah. talk about the second question. Uh, yeah, so I know some of the African countries, uh, actually no uh, African country has solicited uh, investment through African Union. It's mainly just uh, through the uh, their countries themselves, and maybe through this uh, forum of China-Africa cooperation through this forum. And uh, uh, yeah, some countries, they are more uh, proactive in attracting foreign uh, investment, especially Actually, uh, the Ethiopian is very well known for this. So their ambassadors uh, they very actively uh, visited different uh, factories in China and uh, tried to uh, take these uh, uh, investors uh, to invest in their own countries. In fact, the uh, Ethiopian investment agency even won an award for its uh, uh, yeah, effectiveness of attracting foreign investment from China, but also I think from other countries. Yeah. Thank you, Sherryang. Um, Veda, you get the last. I think Manjusha wanted to say something. You could go ahead, Veda. Yeah. Okay. No, I just um, a quick point on the on the first question. I think a lot of the projects that I've done recently, there's been a conscious attempt to reach out to research institutes in the continent and to researchers in the continent, and we've done these studies together. And I think that was a very conscious uh, decision. Um, and I think it's been it's re uh, it's been really interesting because oftentimes we would go into uh, meetings and come out with different takeaways, or we would read different things from cer certain statements that were said and so on. So I feel like, um, especially as um, scholars who are not African studying um, dynamics of Asian powers or other external powers in Africa, it's very important to keep in mind um, uh, the perspectives, obviously, that's coming from the continent, not just of uh, the scholarship that emanates from the continent, but also to try and speak to, you know, people who aren't um, experts who are sort of um, working in these spaces. Uh, just sort of wanted to throw that out. And I'm sure everybody else on the panel does too, but I I'd actually, I think Lena should have the last word on this, just saying. Um, Manjusha, did you want to come in quickly and then um, we'll go to Lena? Yeah, yeah, I also wanted to respond to the first question. And again, there is like huge variation, like in South Africa, it is going through that moment where they are decolonizing the curriculum. So that was a big part of their fees must uh, fall movement and so on. So there is a lot of uh, um, debates and discussions and anxiety around. Uh, that is where I think they are thinking, I mean, uh, uh, controversies around Gandhi statues and so on, right? So, um, and also I guess the historical memory, I mean, they always, uh, people who might talk to even in the mining communities, so they, they kind of associate Indians with money lending and banking and all that. So, uh, so even I was like uh, treated very, uh, I mean, suspiciously by them, what my intentions are, which is very different from how I felt in Ethiopia. And I remember, so all this, I, even the idea of the new scramble came from Patrick Bond, who's a um, South African economist. Uh, but I also remember in New York Times, there was an article on an exhibition by a Kenyan artist on the Chinese debt trap and the murals or paintings that he... Um, Michael yeah, so which is interesting. So, they, so yeah, a lot of narratives going on, not just from the scholarly community and perceptions are quite... 
Thank you. Uh, Lena, the last word is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, uh, um, I, I think I want to comment on the first question, the question about scholarship coming from the continent on China, Africa. And, and really, there's really good news coming uh, from this front because we see more and more um, institutes opening up and uh, institutions that are interested in uh, this matter of knowledge production on Africa's position in the world, whether it's with China or with Europe or with the US. And there is actually really great, um, and actually a, a really good news in, in, in my view, in terms of um, these institutions that are doing this work. So for example, just to throw a couple, so Wits University has a center that studies uh, Africa-US relations. Um, there's recently been a new institute, um, uh, basically uh, in, in Ghana, that uh, so sort of a think tank that does China-Africa relations. Um, there are uh, all kinds of initiatives springing out uh, all throughout the continent, and it's basically our ethical commitment and obligation uh, to both sort of reach out and uh, be aware of uh, and include all those colleagues from these different areas uh, into our conversations when we study these things, they are there. So the knowledge is being produced, it is there, it is growing, there are a lot of initiatives, it's, 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 it's blooming. Um, it's just up to us to basically engage that work and be more inclusive and thank you for giving me the sort of the last word in sort of in being inclusive speaking actually from the continent to you today so I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Lena. And I think it's, it's it's a kind of important note for us to end on and, and you kind of, you know, see this as maybe, um, I mean, this was an incredibly rich conversation, um, but hopefully the first of many conversations and maybe in future conversations, we will do a better job of getting more voices um, from countries within Africa rather than, you know, us folks who are sitting um, either in India, China or the United States, as it were. Um, but I do want to thank each one of our panelists for taking the time for joining us. I hope there will be future conversations on these kinds of ideas and topics going ahead at ICI. Um, I would also like to give a few more thanks. Uh, first to my colleague at the New School, Sean Jacobs, um, at Africa as a Country for his support, um, to Mark Fraser, my co-director at the India-China Institute, um, Michael Evans, who's at the New School IT um, Department, um, and the India-China Institute's Deputy Director, Grace Ho, and her team, who always ensure that things work seamlessly behind the scenes. Um, and finally, thank you to all in the audience who have been um, part of this conversation. So thank you and goodbye.